Okay, welcome back. And now we are into section two. We're looking at calculating the probability of a type two error. So we're taking a little bit of a break from doing hypothesis tests specifically, but this is absolutely related to hypothesis testing. All of the tests that we've done so far, as you have seen, we've always been controlling for our level of significance, which is our exposure to a type one error. That type one error, of course, is incorrectly rejecting a true null hypothesis. So we can control our exposure to a type one error by stating or selecting some level of significance. I'm comfortable here with a 5% chance of committing a type one error. So now let's have a little bit of a discussion on type two error. How do we control our exposure to a type two error, which is incorrectly accepting a false null? I say accepting with my little air quotes. We don't ever say accept. If I say I accept the null, it implies the null is true. But we don't know that. When our evidence supports the null hypothesis, all that means is that we do not support or we cannot support the alternative hypothesis. So we don't say the null is true. We simply say I'm unable to support the alternative. Now, that all sounds like a bunch of nonsense. So this problem, you might recognize this problem. We're working off of problem 918, the very first problem uh, that we worked on. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these steps again. We've already done that. What we know from that problem is that we're doing here a lower tail test, right? We're filling these bottles of beer to 12 ounces. It's a serious penalty. We face serious penalties if we overstate it. So we want to make sure that the amount that we're putting in to those bottles is not less than what we're saying it is. So we're not underfilling, which might be the same as overstating the amount. So we have here this lower tail test that we've already gone through. And we did this test at the 0.05 level of significance. Okay, so we don't really need to worry about parts A through E here. But what I want to, to draw your attention to is kind of the method of, first of all, calculating the probability of committing a type two error. And so that's what we're gonna look at here. Now, one of the problems, one of the complications that comes up in calculating the probability of a type two error is that calculating the probability precisely is reliant on knowing the actual population mean, which we don't ever know. So this is kind of hypothetical, but it gives us important information about what we call the power of our test, which is one minus the probability of committing a type two error. And really that comes down to how capable are we to distinguish a difference between our test statistic and the hypothesized value if our hypothesized value is very close to the true population mean? That sounds a little bit tedious. So let's go through um, a little bit of discussion and then you'll see what I mean by that. So for this problem, this was set up as a lower tail test. So we would have had then a distribution that looks something like this. And of course, this is when we assume HO is true. And we assume it's true with equality. So our hypothesized value here was 12. Now, when we went through this, we, we talked about the sample and we don't have to worry about what our sample actually was here. We had it was 11.4, but it doesn't matter. The process of hypothesis testing was that we found our sample X bar. We then standardized 
that sample so that we could compare it to the standard normal distribution. So we use this formula that you're all very familiar with now. And then that gave us a z-score that corresponded with our sample. What did we do? Well, p-value approach, critical value approach. Here I'm going to talk exclusively about the critical value approach because what we did was in that standard normal distribution, we had some critical value z alpha that we compared our test statistic against. And if our test statistic for this lower tail test, if it was less than that, whoops, if it was less than that critical value, well then we would reject. If it was greater than that critical value, we would not reject. So, so that critical value really di differentiated, it delineated our rejection space and our do not reject space. So this is all, you know, hopefully you're comfortable with this. What we're going to do now is kind of go backwards. Whereas I understand that each sample mean that we draw is going to convert into a different z-score that we then compare against that critical value z-alpha. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go this way. And I'm going to say, what is that value of z, no, back up, what is that value of x bar that would result in a test statistic exactly equal to my critical value? So if I take that critical value here, which for this test, this is alpha 0.05, which again, when we go down to our tables, I don't want to go through this every single time, but here we are. We have 0.05 is in the middle. So that critical value is 1.6. And then again, we're just between here. So my second and third decimals are right there. So my critical value, this it would be negative 1.645. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this formula and I say, okay, my critical value is negative 1.645. That defines that, that rejection region. What is the value for that x bar, I'm going to call it x bar star, because this is that value that if I drew a sample with a mean equal to x bar star, that would give me a test statistic exactly equal to my critical value. And then I'll just substitute in all of our other known values. So there's my hypothesized value. Our standard deviation was here 2.1. And our sample size was here, whoops, 25. There we go. So now I'm just working backwards. Rather than converting my sample mean into a test statistic, I'm now calculating what is that sample mean that corresponds with my critical value. So I'm just going to rearrange this. This is going to be negative 1.645 times 2.1 over root 25 plus 12. So x bar star that equals 2, where's my calculator here, 1.645 times 2.1 over root 25 is just 5, and that should be negative, plus 12. So now I'm just going to go ahead and calculate my x bar star. So this is going to be a negative, oops, negative 
1.6, no, that was happening. 1.645 negative times 2.1 over root 25 plus 12. So that gives me a value of 11.30. Okay, well, so what? what? What does that number mean? Let, let's be a little more precise here. I'll round it to 31 just to be safe. Well, this value, 11.31, that now tells me that when I draw a sample from my population, if that sample has a mean that is less than or equal to 11.31, that's going to correspond with a test statistic that is less than that critical value. If I draw a sample with a mean that is greater than 11.31, that's going to result in a test statistic that is greater than that critical value. Okay, so I've, I've converted that critical value into a sample mean. So now we can really apply that critical value rejection rule using that sample mean that corresponds with the critical value. Why, why, why did I bother doing this? Well, because now, now we can determine the likelihood or the probability of committing type two errors under different circumstances or different values of what the true population mean might be. So let's come up here. Finally, now we can start part F. If the actual population mean is 11, what is the probability of committing a type two error? Okay, so if the actual population mean is 11, which again, we don't know that, but for the purpose of the discussion, if it's 11, well, that's somewhere here, right? It's greater than 11.3, it's less than 12. So let's say that's around here somewhere. Oh, it's less than 11.31, what am I talking about? Here we are, here's 11. Now, Remember what a type two error is. A type two error is that we draw a sample that leads us to incorrectly accept the null hypotheses. Now, notice this value 11. Well, that value 11, it satisfies the alternative. So if the actual population mean is 11, the correct conclusion to the test should be to reject. But what we want to find out here is that if it's 11, what's the likelihood that I fail to reject? What is the probability that I draw a sample from this distribution that will lead me to not reject? or for the purpose of this exercise, I'll use the word accept. So what I'm gonna do, I know that this value, 1131, differentiates my rejection space from my acceptance space. If I drop this value down into this other distribution, 11.31, okay. Well, now it's starting to look like something. Now, if this is what our actual distribution looks like, what is the probability of drawing a sample from that distribution that will fall into this, I'm gonna use quotation marks, this accept space? Well, now it's just like any other type of test or type of calculation that we've done. We want to know what is the probability 
of, of obtaining a sample with a mean greater than 11.31 from this distribution. Well, now the process is really very, very similar. I want to standardize that value, 1131 minus 11 over, we have the same population standard deviation over root 25. That gives me a Z value, 11.31 minus 11 divided by 2.1 over 5. That gives me a value here of 0 0.7, let's say, well, 738. We can keep it to three decimals. So now I've normalized that value, that now I can determine that probability of drawing a sample from that distribution that will falsely or incorrectly lead me to accept my null hypotheses. Go to our Z table. My value of interest here is 0.738 or 0.74. I want the upper tail probability because this upper tail probability, well, that's that acceptance space. So I'm going to go and I'm going to look at the negative side again because I'm taking advantage of the symmetry here. And so negative 0.7, oops, 0.74. So this is to come way down here. And there's the corresponding probability, 0.23. So this gives me what is called beta of 0.23. That is my probability of committing a type 2 error if the actual population mean is 11. And that's it. I say that's it like it was no big deal. It's usually a little bit tedious and usually students need to go through this a couple of times to really see what's happening. Let's go ahead and do it again. What if the actual population mean is 11.5? Okay, well, much of the, the first steps that we've done don't change. We have this distribution that is when we assume that HO is true. We know that this value, 11.31, defines our rejection space. Any sample means less than that, we will reject. Any sample means greater than that will lead to a do not reject, or for the sake of this discussion, I'll say accept. Now, if we have a true population mean of 11.5, what does that do to the exposure or to the, the probability of committing a type 2 error? Well, here's 11.5. Notice we're getting closer to our hypothesized value but we're still, these are still values that satisfy the alternative. So the alternative here is true, but not by very much, right? At this point, we were looking at 11 and 12. We were further apart. The alternative was true by a greater difference than here. Here, the alternative is still true, but what happens to our exposure to our type 2 error? How easy is it going to be for us to identify this small difference? For us to correctly reject that null hypothesis? Well, that's the power of the test, correctly rejecting. And that's 1 minus our exposure to a type 2. So here, if I take this value down again, I have 11.31. And again, any sample mean greater than that 
is going to lead us to accept. Right? It's just what we have here. Any value greater than that is going to lead us to accept. So now what I want is to calculate this area. Because now again, I still want to know what is the probability of drawing a sample from this distribution that will lead me to accept. Even though here I can see my alternative is true. Well, the process here is the same. I need to standardize this value. This is 2.1 over the square root of 25, which we know is just 5. Calculate that, 1131 minus 11.5 divided by 2.1 over 5. Now I have a value negative 0.45. We go to our tables. Now this can be a little bit tricky. Remember, what the, the area that I want here is my upper tail probability. I want this area here. When I go down to my Z tables and I look up negative 0.45, there's negative 0.45. So that comes way down to here. Well, that's giving me an area, a probability of 0.326. But don't forget, those are lower tail probabilities. That's telling me that this area is 0.326. What I want is this area up here, which is going to be 1 minus 0.326. Which gives me 0 0.674. That is my beta, my probability of committing a type 2 error if the actual population mean is 11.5. Now, notice what's happened here to my, ex my likelihood of committing a type 2 error. When the actual population mean, so again, first of all, to even be exposed to a type 2 error means that the alternative must be true. And I incorrectly accept the null. So in both of these cases, my alternative is true. Here I have a mean of 11. Here I have a mean of 11.5. What's happening to my exposure, the probability of committing a type 2 error, as that actual mean gets closer to my hypothesized value of 12. It gets larger, right? It gets much more difficult to correctly reject if my alternative is just barely correct. We can imagine, again, I'm running out of room here, if we looked at another test or another scenario, I'm going to leave that number there just because I don't want to forget it. If this is 12, and let's say that the actual value, we denote it mu a, which is a, a, a population mean that satisfies the alternative, what if it's 11.999? Well, that still satisfies my alternative. But it's sitting almost on top of my hypothesized value. Here's that 11.31. Any value greater than that is going to lead me to accept. What happens here, this was my beta uh, at a mean of 11.5. My beta at a mean of 11.9999, it's going to be approaching 0.95 which means that it's, it becomes extremely likely if that value that satisfies my alternative is very close to my hypothesized value, 
it becomes very difficult to identify that difference. And when you hear me talk about power, which is the probability of correctly rejecting a null hypothesis, well, in this case here, my power is 0.05, meaning there's really only a 5% chance that I'm going to correctly reject my null. As opposed to up here, the power of my test at this point, 1 minus 0.23, well, here there's a 78% chance that I will correctly reject my null hypotheses. So, that gives us some idea of what we mean by type 2 error, calculating the probability of a type 2 error, and correspondingly, the power of the test. So, last one, and then I'll end this video. What is our probability of committing a type 2 error if the actual population mean is 12.5? I always like this question, because when I do a question like this in a classroom, I'll usually sit back for a while and I'll say, okay, students, it's your turn. You go ahead and you do the calculations. I've already done a couple of examples. Now you guys go and do the calculations. And, and, I, and I watch as they work hard. They've got heads down. They're struggling away. And again, you know, this comes with practice. And maybe I pick on my students sometimes, especially when we're just learning things because mistakes are the best way to learn. And again, you get into this routine, you get into this habit that, okay, I need to calculate type 2 error, I have to do this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and you get into this, this habit without just stopping and thinking, hey, wait a minute. If the true population mean is 12.5, well, then the null actually is true. It's impossible for me to commit a type 2 error because a type 2 error is incorrectly accepting the null. A type 2 error is that the, the alternative is true, but I, I, my evidence supports the null. If the mean is actually 12.2, my exposure to a type 2 error is zero because the null is true. I cannot commit a type 2 error. Okay, that's enough for this one. I'll come back and start another quick video and we'll go through J, uh, G. How do we actually control our exposure for it? Here I can see how we can calculate it and how we can get some idea of the power of the test and how it changes depending on the proximity of the true unknown value and my hypothesized value. If the alternative is true, if it's true by a lot, then it's really easy. My power of my test is going to be quite high. If the alternative is very true, meaning this distribution here is not 11.99. I know, didn't I just say I was going to start another video and here I am talking again? We saw what happens if it's sitting on top of it. What if it's way down here somewhere? What if it's, I don't know, 10? Let's be even more extreme. That's not extreme enough. Let's say it's way down here. Let's say it's 8. A value that satisfies my alternative. What is the likelihood now? of drawing a sample from that distribution that leads me to incorrectly accept my null. Whew. That's a pretty small probability. You can go through the calculations, I'm not going to for now. But you can see how my the probability of committing a type 2 error shrinks as the difference between my hypothesized value and the actual value grows. When that distance is large, when my alternative is very true, it's easier to identify it than if it's just barely true. 
it can be very difficult to correctly identify it. And I'm more likely to make a type 2 error here than I would be here. Okay, 30 minute video, too long already. So that's it, now we'll come here, we know how to calculate our, our probability of type 2. Let's see how we can control for it. Okay, thanks for watching guys, bye bye.